Mrs. Bush and Mrs. Quayle will both address the convention tonight. Today, the first and second families were out campaigning together. Here's ABC's Brit Hume. Harry Truman's fabled whistle-stop campaign of 1948 is the model Mr. Bush says he'll try to match this year. He and his running mate and their wives managed to look at least like they were on the back of a caboose as they arrived at a glitzy Houston fundraiser today. The hoopla, however, failed to stir some Republicans in the thousand-dollar-a-plate crowd who looked mostly worried. The president was trying to stir them up himself when he got a little unintentional help from some AIDS protesters who had infiltrated the press stand and interrupted his speech. This guy got a problem up there? Is they with the press tour? That woke up the crowd, which quickly drowned out the protesters with the chant of four more years. Once order was restored, the president departed from his text to defend his record on AIDS research. We have the best scientists working on the problem, and my heart is full of compassion, and we are doing what we can to get to the bottom of that. The strain of this difficult year showed a bit in the president's emotional closing to these Texans, many of whom have supported him since he first entered politics. And I look forward to this fight. I can feel it. I can feel it building in my blood. And the one thing that is the most comfort is that through good times and bad, I have had you at my side. And we want to thank you for this fantastic show of support. This may be Mr. Bush's week, and these may be his people, but that quaver in his voice is a sign of the pressure and pain of what has so far not been his year. Peter? Thank you, Britt. During a convention week, it is always this way, the candidate, in this case the president, becomes a good deal more available for one-on-one -on -one interviews than at other times. Mr. Bush has given numerous interviews this week, and we were offered one for today. We talked politics, not issues. We began by asking him how he felt about what was being said by others speaking here on his behalf. What did he think of his campaign chairman saying Democrats are not America? And Pat Buchanan saying that Democrats are on the wrong side in a religious war for the country's soul. I would leave each of these people to describe for them what they want, just as I would ask those who heard me being bashed at the Democratic Convention over and over and over again to interpret whether they believe that stuff. I think what I want people to do is believe what I say. I can't speak for everybody that's out there supporting me. I can't agree with all the rhetoric, but I can certainly say I'm very glad they're out there supporting me. Um, let me come with the Hillary Clinton issue again. Do you think she's a legitimate target? I don't, no, I don't like going after the wife. I think if the, if the wife is in the arena, and if they're saying you get two for one, and here's my views as a, as a uh, you know, defender of children, or uh, running of a foundation, I think that's slightly different than uh, if the person was not injecting oneself into the issue business. If you're out there on issues, taking your case to the people on issues, and you have an activist path, and you're a very aggressive lawyer sitting at the ABA Association presenting views, that is a little different than if you're not taking positions. I think most people would agree with that. What do you think it does say, sir, to your political dilemma that after four years as president, 12 years in the White House, you are expected this week to make the political speech of your life? I've heard it said many times from Republicans. It isn't supposed to be that hard for a sitting president, is it? No. Sounds like deja vu, though. Yogi Berra said deja vu all over again. What do you mean? Well, because I was here in four, four years ago, not as president, but with eight years in office, uh, undergoing, uh, you know, the same kind of, um, of uh, appraisal. And uh, it all worked out. So you just don't get discouraged. You take it on the chin over and over again, and then you come out fighting and take your case to the American people. I, is, it not, is it nonetheless discouraging to you? No, I don't get discouraged. I, I, I couldn't. If I, you're in this business, Peter, you gotta learn to take criticism. That what you think is fair, that's what you think is unfair. You keep your head up and you do your best, and the final analysis, you believe that the American people are safe. Hey, I may disagree with this guy on issue A, B, or C, but I trust him. He's experienced, he's knowledgeable, he knows who he wants to take this country, and I trust him. And that's what, that's how I think this is going to work out. But nonetheless, if you find yourself at your own convention with members of your own party, eagerly hoping that you will, in your 
acceptance speech this week, redefine yourself after all this time. I, I don't get it. Well, I think that there's a misperception. Uh, I've read in some of the media that uh, I have no domestic agenda. I don't care about domestic issues. That is 100% nuts. It's wrong. Crazy. And I've spent an awful lot of time, and I will explain to the American people why we have not been able to pass the best crime legislation that would help clean up these streets, the best health care reform bill, the best uh, record in, in uh, own economy to stimulate the economy. And I think there's a misperception. Do you believe, as your wife suggested a couple of times yesterday, that the media is against you? I wouldn't say against me, but I think it's presented a one-sided picture. Yes, I strongly believe that. And the irony is I think the American people know that. More of the president later this evening, and in a minute, family values again. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Brought to you by the Discover Car. Oh, you just got a cash advance, did you? Too bad you used an ordinary credit card. Because you could be carrying very heavy interest charges. Why not carry the Discover card? Just pay your full monthly balance on a small transaction fee and we'll forget the interest. Which means our money comes with no strings attached. It pays to Discover. Why Centrum Silver? Because you're over 50 and you're just hitting your stride. Centrum Silver Vitamins. Because the latest scientific research about changing nutritional needs after 50 is built in. Centrum Silver. It's a great time to be silver. Oh, great. Just what my stomach needs. Here comes my obnoxious boss. Hi, Daddy. Uh, oh, boy. Better make it Maalox. Because extra strength Maalox Plus neutralizes more acid than Mylanta. So you better make it Maalox. The pro forma business of the convention will take place here tonight. The nomination of the president and the vice president. Nominating speeches, roll call, the whole shebang, as they say. But the Republicans are not calling this nomination night. As we have noted, it's family values night. Quite a prominent theme for the next, the last night of this gathering. ABC's Jeff Greenfield on what the Republicans thinking is. No trust? doubt about it, says the president. It's a central campaign issue. Purpose. Who do you trust to fight for the ideas? that will help rebuild our families and restore our fundamental values. The family values movement is driven by a sense that our culture is under siege. From violence on the screen, sex on TV, abortion on demand, public displays of homosexuality, all threatening what once seemed to be a clear sense of right and wrong. Delegates here have their own definitions of family values. My right to tell and, con uh, and instruct and raise my children according to my rights and wrongs, not those of the teachers or the media. Don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. But do concerns about the culture really matter at the poll? Yes, says one analyst. I mean, I, I think you can make the case that Democrats lost five of the last six presidential elections because in some large measure people were voting on values issues. And why do voters care? I think they want to know that their leadership has got its moral headgear on right, that essentially it responds and believes as they do. That's one big reason Our Bill Clinton today. often strikes traditional values themes in his speeches. Governments don't raise children, parents do. This year, Democrats say, family values will be taking second place to other concerns. And, and it seems clear to us that what people are most concerned about are jobs and the economy. We may have a chance to find out. With economic issues cutting heavily for the Democrats this year, the Republican stress on family values is going to be stronger than ever. If that can help produce a Bush victory in November, the political potency of family values will be beyond debate. Peter? Thank you, Jeff. The fundamentalist minister, Pat Robertson, will promote that family values theme here this evening. So will the country singer Winona Judd. But they'll both play second fiddle to Marilyn Quayle and Barbara Bush. Seeing the leading politicians' wives on the podium has not been a regular feature of many conventions. ABC's Lynn Schur on why it's important this year. The way it used to be, Republican candidates' wives were seen, not heard, thanks to this little-remembered list of rules to wives of candidates issued by Republicans back in 1972. When your husband is speaking, it advised, watch him proudly, never appear bored, never detract from him, steer clear of controversial statements. 
So no wonder we saw Betty Ford, then Nancy Reagan, obediently and silently gazing at their mates. In 1984, Nancy Reagan changed the rules by becoming the first presidential candidate's wife to speak to a convention. That forced her husband to watch her proudly. But her speech politely avoided controversy and substance. In 1988, Barbara Bush addressed the New Orleans Convention, but as she herself put it, the really sad thing is, none of you <laughs> listen. <Remember. laughs> this year, things are different. People will be listening for one simple reason. She's the most popular woman in America and maybe in the, in the whole world, or at least up there with Mother Teresa. Republicans are hoping that popularity will translate into votes for the president. Marilyn Quayle will also speak tonight, but don't expect controversy. As one strategist told us, the rules for wives haven't changed that much. Peter? Thanks, Lynn. Lynn Scherr will be with us tonight. We'll be back in a moment. With puffing eyes, the children show minds open hearts through. Our spirits grow the touch the feel the fabric of our of lots of vitamins and minerals. Kellogg's has only one. I'm surprised. Total Raisin Bran with the total difference. Now you don't need a prescription to get prescription strength medicine for itches and rashes. Introducing new Maximum Strength Cordade. Now with twice the healing medicine. New Maximum Strength Cordade. Prescription strength without a prescription. In art, taste is subjective, but in life, Good taste is well defined. Fancy Feast Gourmet Cat Food. Exceptionally moist and delicious. Fancy Feast. Good taste is easy to recognize. Do you get diarrhea too? Yes, I do get diarrhea. And what I take is kale pectate. I have no time to be sick. Kale pectate stops the symptoms fast. It gets rid of the diarrhea. Kale pectate works every time. Even here in Houston, where the focus is sharply on politics, people like people everywhere in the country are talking about an ugly child custody battle that's spilled onto the front pages everywhere. Movie director Woody Allen is fighting his former companion, Mia Farrow, for custody of their children. He admits, as you've heard or read, having a love affair with one of Ms. Farrow's adopted children, but vehemently denies the charge of molesting another of her children. So much of what is being heard in the Allen Farrow case from two normally very private people strikes so many other people as sad and even bizarre. And yet there is one facet of all this which caught the attention of ABC's Rebecca Chase, who covers family issues for us. The accusations of child molestation as part of a custody battle. Those who mediate custody disputes between divorcing couples say there has definitely been an increase in charges of child sexual abuse. For example, in Los Angeles County, six years ago, 11 such charges were made. Last year, there were 115. That is only 1% of custody cases, and courts have become suspicious of allegations that surface only after a custody fight begins. Still, they can be among the most troubling and time-consuming, according to family law experts. See, sexual abuse is a very easy allegation to make and real difficult to prove. The vast majority of these charges are made by mothers. Several studies have found that between 50 and 75 percent of these allegations turn out to be unfounded. But unfounded doesn't mean untrue. It only means not proven. So within those statistics, there's no way of knowing how many of them were true and they couldn't prove it. As sexual abuse trials like the McMartin preschool case have shown, there is usually no physical evidence and a child's testimony can sometimes be manipulated. Children can be pawns. Uh, they can be coached. Uh, they can become mirror reflections uh, of their parents. In any event, the custody decision has to be delayed while the charges are investigated. And in the meantime, the parent accused is usually forbidden to see the child. Most judges do not take a chance that the allegations are false, and they immediately sever the contact while something goes on while they do investigations. No matter what the outcome of an investigation, hardly anyone is ever satisfied. 
Accused fathers feel reputations are ruined. Mothers have been known to take children into hiding after they lose in the courts. And children are caught in the middle. Rebecca Chase, ABC News, Atlanta. In the economic news today, a bit more positive than yesterday's report on housing. And now, the Delaware Valley's only primetime news hour. Fox 29's The Telefox News. Good evening, everyone. Jill Chernikoff has the night off. I'm Tracy Matasek. And I'm Lee McCarthy. Here's what's happening. This is the night when the Republican Party formally nominates George Bush for a second term as president. But the enthusiasm of the delegates to the convention could be tempered somewhat by a new poll released tonight by ABC News and the Washington Post. Taken after the party adopted its conservative platform, after Pat Buchanan's conservative speech, and after Ronald Reagan's stirring remarks, the poll shows that none of those events benefited Mr. Bush. Bill Clinton maintained a 25-point lead over the president among registered voters, 57 to 32 percent. Among those likely to vote, the margin is the same at 58 to 33 percent. Members of the Bush campaign expect the convention to give Mr. Bush a boost in the polls, but that hasn't happened yet. Tonight's session started two hours ago. For months, the Republicans have been talking about family values, and tonight they are going to define what those values are. The bulk of that job has been given to Mrs. Bush. She was selected in part because recent polls show that she is three times more popular than her husband. Earlier today, Mrs. Bush was downplaying the importance of her speech. She and her husband campaigned with Vice President and Mrs. Quayle in an attempt to build hype for the president's acceptance speech tomorrow night. Eric Sean has more on today's events. This guy got a problem up there? On the day of his renomination, George Bush was confronted by the uninvited. AIDS activists defiantly waving condoms at the commander-in-chief. As his supporters tried to drown out the shouts, police tackled the protesters and Bush defended his record on AIDS. We have the best scientists working on the problem, and my heart is full of compassion, and we are doing what we can to get to the bottom of that. Adding muscle to the Bush campaign was Arnold Schwarzenegger and other Hollywood movie stars as the president did damage control after reports of a cabinet shakeup. He told me that I'm doing a great job, and I said, thank you, Mr. President, and he said, uh, don't give another thought to this uh, ridiculous story. But tonight, the convention is anxiously waiting for the newly feisty Barbara Bush who will preach family values and her husband's advisors hope will help pull off a political miracle. But she downplayed her speech. When you talk about the most overrated speech by the most uh, overrated person that's been given tonight. A lot of pressure. Tomorrow, no. I mean, I know me, you know me. It's not going to be any different. And tomorrow you're going to wake up and say, huh? <laughs> what was that all about? Some consider Barbara Bush the Republican secret weapon. Yeah. Tough true get sympathetic don't be surprised if she takes the white gloves off i'm eric sean fox news houston tonight the gop is stressing the politics of inclusion speakers addressed women's and minority issues as well as aids mary fisher is a 44 year old florida artist who has the aids virus she contracted the disease from her ex-husband fisher says no family or community is safe from so the disease i am white and a mother i am one with a black infant struggling with tubes in a Philadelphia hospital. So I am female and contracted this disease in marriage and enjoy the warm support of my family. I am one with the lonely gay man sheltering a flickering candle from the cold wind of his family's rejection. Fisher says President Bush has done a lot of good in the fight against AIDS, but more needs to be done. Family values also is a major topic for the GOP tonight. Marilyn Quayle, wife of the vice president, was among the speakers on that topic. Our generation has benefited as no other from the opportunities that America provides. So now is not the time to turn away from the values that brought us here. Pennsylvania Senator Arlen Specter has been laying low at the convention in Houston. It appears that Specter wants to avoid giving the Democrats any ammunition for the Senate race this fall. Jacqueline Bolden reports. There are plenty of Republicans at the convention in Houston, but many are missing. Half of the GOP members of the U.S. House of Representatives and one-third of the Senate had other plans. Arlen Specter is there, but has stayed out of the limelight. He's there. He doesn't want to be too close. He came home. 
he went back to the convention, he returned to, to Pennsylvania, returned to the convention. Twice he shifted back and forth between Pennsylvania and Houston, trying to do his duties here and not be too identified with uh, George Bush at the moment. He represents his constituents with honor. Just two months ago, President Bush helped very, raise a million dollars for Specter at this fundraiser in central Pennsylvania. And many thought Specter would be rewarded by the Bush campaign with a speaking part in Houston after his role in the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill hearings. I have uh, a good standing with the party, uh, but I have never made a speech at the convention, and I'm not making a speech now. Spector said last week that he has a prominent role at the convention as head of the Pennsylvania delegation. But Spector is a liberal in a party which is trying to call home conservatives. And with Democrat Lynn Yackel trying to tie Spector to the failing economic policies of the bush Quayle administration, Spector is trying to maintain some distance from an unpopular president. If the race evens up and Bush's popularity is restored, the distance between Arlen Specter and George Bush will narrow considerably as the campaign rolls on. And besides, Specter is among the six Republican senators who most frequently vote against the president. So a little political distance is not unusual and may not last. In Philadelphia, Jacqueline Bolden, the 10 o'clock news. While the Republicans were trying to tear down the foundation of the Democrats' campaign, Bill Clinton and Al Gore were building a different foundation in Atlanta. The two candidates and their families joined former President Jimmy Carter in building a house for low-income buyers. However, both found time away from the Habitat for Humanities project to comment on their opponents. Clinton had this reaction to reports that Mr. Bush will shake up his cabinet if he is re-elected. A stunning acknowledgement of failure in the first term, isn't it? That's my, re that's my reaction. 80 days before the election, uh, we're running it. This gentleman here reminds me of running on the Christopher Columbus theory. Give us a fourth term and we'll discover America. Clinton also called Republican attacks on his record in Arkansas, quote, as authentic as AstroTurf. Mayor Ed Rendell will announce the name of Philadelphia's new police commissioner tomorrow, but we learned today that that man is Chief Inspector Richard Neal. Neal, who is a 30-year veteran of the force, will fill the vacancy left when former Commissioner Willie Williams left to become the top cop in Los Angeles. Acting Commissioner Thomas Seaman was also a contender for the job. Tonight, both he and Inspector Neal say there can be no celebration until the formal announcement is made. Yeah, I think we need to wait until tomorrow and uh, let the uh, mayor announce who his police commissioner is. Please. Mayor Rendell will formally name Neal commissioner at 11 a.m. at City Hall. A southwest Philadelphia man is dead and a three-year-old boy critically injured after an argument ended in a hail of bullets. As Farland Chang reports, police are now searching for the men responsible for the murder. Many of these children were playing on their street when an argument erupted into gunfire. On the 1300 block of Divinity Place near 48th and Woodland Avenue, police marked the bullet shells left behind after one man was killed and two children, innocent bystanders, were wounded. Somebody got shot over there. I heard somebody they was crying. It was like, oh, my baby, my baby, and they was running and all that. Police say the victim is a 28-year-old man whose mother lives on the street. Witnesses say he was arguing with some men in a passing car. One man in the car stepped out and shot the victim in the back. Neighbors on the street are frightened for their children after a three-year-old boy caught in the middle was shot in the back and a 13-year-old boy was grazed by another bullet. I mean, it's terrible because the kids that got it, that got shot and everything. I mean, you can't even sit outside anymore. It's a shame. Police searched for suspects and brought in several people for questioning, but police later released all of the men shown here. Police are searching for three or four black men who were driving in a small blue car. The trigger man is about six feet tall and wearing a blue t-shirt. Police say they do not know just what caused the shooting. But neighbors speculate there may have been a personal feud between the gunman and the victim. Whatever the cause, relatives had to deal with the death in the family, and neighbors must carry on with the effect of violence. It's not right that people had to be shot around in the neighborhood. It should be a peaceful neighborhood for everybody to play and everything. But said that they had to be shot. It's not right. In Southwest Philadelphia, Farlin Chang, the 10 o'clock news. Coming up, a day in court for the... The Delaware Valley's only primetime newscast. Fox 29, the 10 o'clock news. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Bold, and here's what's happening. Several families are finally returning to their homes at this hour after an afternoon fire forced them to flee. The five-alarm blaze sent black, billowing clouds into the sky. And as Rich Maneri reports, 
Neighbors say the fire never should have happened. Flames and smoke swallowed most of a city block in North Philadelphia. The fire started about 1.15 this afternoon in an abandoned warehouse near 3rd and Somerset Streets, but it could be seen from miles away. This is a view from South Philadelphia. The blaze quickly spread through the complex of buildings, some of which were being used to store paper products. Neighbors say the old vacant building was being used as a crack house and a garbage dump. Firefighters believe this was no accident. Large vacant manufacturing buildings like we have in this section of the city, a little bit further over into Kensington, really have no utility, so there's no basic accidental causes of ignition. Uh, we'll continue to investigate this fire, our fire marshal's office, but in all probability, we're going to find that this fire was set by vandals. About 30 homes here on 3rd Street had to be evacuated for two reasons. One, the fire itself, and two, firefighters were afraid the walls of the building might come tumbling down. I looked at the window and there was fire coming out of the factory. The wires started blowing up, so everybody had to get out of the house. Iniabel Flores says she and her neighbors have been begging the city to tear this building down before something like this happened. It could have been prevented if, if the city would actually take our phone calls and take this place down, but they don't care. They figure it's the ghetto, so let it happen. It took two hours and five alarms to control this fire. Residents say they are now hoping it will force the city to do what it wouldn't before, tear what's left of this building down. In North Philadelphia, Rich Maneri, the 10 o'clock news. President Bush's rise in the polls after the GOP convention seems to be short-lived. While some polls show that Mr. Bush got a sizable post-convention bounce, Newsweek says otherwise. A poll by Newsweek, which was conducted yesterday, shows that 53% of the voters prefer Democrat Bill Clinton, 39% would vote for Mr. Bush. The poll also showed that Mr. Bush's approval rating was not much changed by the convention, remaining at about 38%. And two-thirds of the people questioned do not think the president is serious about the tax cut he proposed in last Thursday night's speech. Who do you trust to bring it all home? Foreign policy, security policy, and economic policy. Who do you trust? It was a confident and invigorated President Bush who addressed the rain-soaked Georgia crowd this afternoon, still riding the anti-Clinton wave that started at the Republican convention. And I believe the deficit is a dark cloud on the future of these young people, and you know it, and I know it, and Clinton does not know it, and Gore does not know it. But much like his Thursday night acceptance speech, the president was long on rhetoric and short on specifics. You listen to these guys and you think their deficit is a big game of the wheel of fortune? You know that one, they want to buy three vowels? I owe you. That's not good enough for the American taxpayer. Mr. Bush made several stops in southern states that have tended to vote Republican. Those ties need to be maintained if he expects to keep them from the southern Democratic ticket. Meantime, Bill Clinton and Al Gore took their campaign up north in yet another bus caravan. Clinton said the president is trying to paint him as a tax-and-spend liberal, which Clinton says just won't wash. Negative attacks work until they're effectively rebutted. I mean, that's the lesson of the Republican convention. That was the most negative political convention in modern history, certainly in my lifetime. They said nothing positive. President Bush repeated his calls for across-the-board tax cuts and spending caps, but has yet to reveal details. But the Democrats were quick to counter, saying that any Republican promise of tax cuts is no more than a political year Trojan horse. The record is that President Bush has signed the second largest tax increase in history, and President Reagan signed the largest tax increase in history. By the standard the Republicans are talking about, they raised taxes over 300 times in the 1980s. Clinton's bus tour will take him through northwest Pennsylvania later this week. President Bush heads to Illinois tomorrow. The airlift to combat famine in Somalia is continuing, although efforts are being concentrated in northeastern Kenya. An American cargo plane loaded with food headed for the region this afternoon. It was the third flight of the mission. U.S. officials are trying to get food to thousands of refugees who have crossed the border. Efforts to get food into Somalia won't begin for a few more days. United Nations troops and U.S. Green Berets have been set up to protect the food from looters. As many as two million people could die within weeks without the food because of the drought and civil unrest. A United Nations compound in Sarajevo was reduced to rubble after a night of shelling by Serbian forces. A series of mortars hit the barracks just minutes before a U.N. Brigadier General returned from his first meeting with the Bosnian president. 
400 soldiers were evacuated, but no one was injured. The attack came as a British newspaper reported that besieged Muslims staged previous attacks on their own people to trigger outside military intervention. Muslim officials deny that the attacks, such as last month's shelling at an orphan's funeral, were ordered by other Muslims. Coming up, Florida braces for the season's first hurricane. Up next, trying to find a home for all those little doggies in the window. Denim jeans at Fine Stores, $38. The same jeans at Ross, $19. At Ross, the only difference is the price. Lenscrafters presents yet another major breakthrough, featherweight lenses. Anything you can do for a really heavy prescription? Try on featherweight. They're so light you hardly know you've got them on. Featherweight lenses, lighter, slimmer, and oh so comfortable. Available only from Lenscrafters in-store labs in about an hour. Featherweight lenses. They're so comfortable. You know, I hardly know I've got them on. Available in about an hour only from LensCrafters. Open evenings and weekends. Call 1-800-522-LENS for the LensCrafters near you. And now the news. This just did. The House of Parliament announces a grand opening sale just in time for back to school. Save an extra 20% off our original low prices on all winter coats, jackets, and snowsuits. Save an extra 20% off girls' knit and woven pants sets. Save on boys' and girls' denim. Seven dollars and eight dollars. The house of bargains brings down the cost of growing up. Mom, I'm done. The Claridge Casino Hotel says you'll like our winning ways. You'll like our winning smile. Friendly crew. You'll like our winning style. Looks brand new. We want to win your heart right from the start. We do it all for you. Yes, they do. From our great restaurants to a dark on the stage. This is new Berry Berry Kicks, a different kind of kid cereal. Mom, can I have it, please? And you know what they'll do to get those kid cereals. Please? You can cut my allowance. Berry Berry Kicks has a crisp corn crunch. I'll even walk the dog. Natural fruit flavors, real fruit juice, and less sugar than most kid cereals. So when your kids say, please? you'll gladly say, okay, new Berry Berry Kicks. That was easy. Out of London tonight comes word that a passenger ship has reportedly sunk off the coast of Malaysia. The ship, the Royal Pacific, had radioed a distress signal, apparently after colliding with a fishing boat. More than 600 people were on board the passenger ship. Ships responding to the SOS have helped rescue 470 people, about 130 still unaccounted for. The ship had left Singapore on a cruise and was about 175 miles north of Singapore when it sent its SOS. Police in Lower Marion are looking for two men who invaded the home of an Asian family yesterday afternoon. The two Korean men forced their way into the home of a Korean family in the 700 block of Conshohocken State Road. A 41-year-old woman and her two children, aged 7 and 9, were tied up while the suspects ransacked and robbed their home. Police have released these sketches of the suspect. Both men are believed to be in their mid-20s. If you have any information, call Lower Marion Police at 649-1000. A potential racial dispute over sidewalk vending in Germantown has been diffused. Tension ran high this week when a Korean merchant operating near Chelton in Germantown Avenues told an African-American vendor to take his business elsewhere. But the city has reached a temporary agreement with the leaders. We were able to put out the immediate fire. Uh, however, we have a whole lot of work to do over the next um, 90 days uh, to come up with a permanent solution. This is our community. If anybody's going to move, it's going to be people who come in our community, who's not a part of this community, come in our community, make money and leave. The city had initially told the vendors to leave, fearing that the dispute would spread to other areas. Thousands of people all over the nation came together today to bring attention to the problem of homeless animals. Dozens of Philadelphians turned out for a vigil tonight at Independence Mall. Mayor Ed Rendell among them. The demonstrators want people to become more aware of pet overpopulation and how many unnecessary deaths could be prevented. As Harlan Chang explains, there's too many pets and too few homes. 
These dogs and cats came into this North Philadelphia shelter without homes. Now they will most likely be killed. That's because there are too many of these animals and not enough room. Animal groups say one cat or dog in the U.S. is put to death by injection every one and a half seconds. This two-week-old kitten was found abandoned on a doorstep. If it stays homeless, it could easily become one of the 17 million cats and dogs that are killed every year. But animal groups say this tragedy can easily be prevented. It's birth control. It's spaying and neutering your animal. It's a simple operation. It'll cost you a tire or a hair perm, and you'll make your dog or cat a better pet. Besides stopping the birth of unwanted pets, another solution is adopting the ones that are already here. We might have got killed, so we wanted to help the dog. Ryan Crace needed only five minutes to know that she wanted this rejected puppy. How did you know this was the one? Because he was cute and playful and active, like the kind of dog my family likes. But only one in six of the pets here will be so lucky. The overpopulation problem has only gotten worse. Just today, 20 more unhoused cats and six more neglected dogs were dropped off here. Animal lovers hope that people will care enough so that these pets can live a full life instead of suffering a needless death. They have them already. In North Philadelphia, Farland <laughs> Chang, the 10 o'clock news. Still to come, another perfect day for beach bums and stun worship. I go and he kissed me in my neck. He's still kissing the same way. You bet your life. Premieres Monday on Channel 10. Newscast. Fox 29, the 10 o'clock news. time to assess the damage from Hurricane Aniki. Overnight, the storm skipped across the northernmost Hawaiian island of Kauai. Hawaiian officials say damage is severe, but they are thankful the hurricane missed the big islands. Oahu is reporting flooding and some damage, but nothing like its smaller neighbor to the north. We get more now on the hurricane damage from Bob Donnelly. Kauai took the brunt of the storm. Destruction is everywhere, the state director of emergency services said. It's just mind-boggling. Hurricane Anike packed sustained winds in excess of 100 miles per hour, coupled with torrential rains and a heavy, pounding surf at times some 30 feet tall have left the island of Kauai in a shambles. Power has been knocked out for more than a day. Nearly every building on Kauai is said to have been damaged. One in every three homes have suffered severe damage. Roofs of houses and even the state building torn right off. It's too early yet for an official government damage estimate, but it's believed that Hurricane Anike will be far more costly than the last storm to pass through these islands a decade ago, leaving some $216 million in damage. A lot of the houses or the, uh, the roofs are off, and when we drove last night, when we drove back to the hotel, we came out of the uh, church, they was clearing the telephone poles from the road, all the telephone poles on the road there. Dan Brady and his wife flew to Hickam Air Force Base on Oahu from nearby Kauai. They took some amateur video of the storm as it passed through. Amazingly, there have been few injuries. Numerous residents have had to be evacuated because of rising floodwaters. For the most part, though, the people of these islands consider themselves very lucky indeed, especially here on the island of Oahu. There was some damage, some slight destruction in areas here, but for the most part, it turned out to be more of an inconvenience than a natural disaster. And as you can clearly see behind me here, the cleanup efforts have already begun. So the people here can get back to their main business, namely tourism. Bob Donnelly on Oahu, Fox News. Vice President Quayle was in Homestead, Florida today, offering reassurance to victims of Hurricane Andrew. Mr. Quayle toured a tent city, home to about 1,200 people. He told residents there President Bush is not going back on his promise to rebuild the Homestead Air Force Base. The administration has been roundly criticized for pledging to rebuild the base when it is closing dozens of others across the U.S. Canada has joined a growing list of nations offering food to millions of starving people in Somalia. War, famine, and drought have left about two million people in danger of starving to death. The United Nations and the Red Cross say they will increase their food shipments, but the planned airdrop of tons of U.S. food will have to wait until ground troops can secure the drop site. In Bosnia, much of the Serbian army's heavy arsenal has fallen silent tonight. The United Nations is supervising all use of the Serbs' big guns. The move is in preparation for next week's peace conference in Geneva, but it did not stop shelling in Sarajevo last night. 
the European community has agreed to support a U.S. proposal for a no-fly zone over Bosnia should the latest peace efforts fail. It has been a low-key weekend for the presidential candidates. President Bush taped a radio address before leaving Washington for Camp David. Governor Bill Clinton is in Virginia attending a private fundraiser. Earlier today, he was at a black family reunion in Washington. Now, the latest poll shows Bill Clinton running ahead of President Bush by 15 points. Newsweek magazine says if the election were held today, Bill Clinton would get 53% of the vote to President Bush's 38%. A majority of those polled blame the economy for their disapproval of the president. It was primary election day in Delaware today. The polls have been closed for a little more than two hours, with 250 districts out of nearly 300 reporting. It appears Governor Mike Castle has won his party's nomination for the U.S. House. He'll run against former Governor S.B., former Lieutenant Governor S.B. Wu in the general election. Congressman Tom Car Carper, the Democrat, will be running for governor against Gary Scott, the Republican. And the Wilmington mayor's race appears to be too close to call. More from Rich Maneri. This is primary weather. Democrat now voting. In record numbers, voters filed into polling places throughout Wilmington to make their choices in the Delaware primary. I would definitely like to see a change within the community as well as within the state and the county and the city of Delaware, Wilmington. There were several races, none more intriguing than the Democratic mayoral primary in Wilmington. State Representative Jim Sills is trying to upset two-term incumbent Dan Frawley. Sills was once considered a long shot, but since more than half of Wilmington's registered voters are African-American, and today African-American voters turned out in droves, Sills likes his chances. I have to believe at this point the turnout um, is an indication of, of, of people's uh, sincere desire for the city to bring about more positive changes in the quality of life in our city. Mayor Frawley and his campaign staff have said throughout this race that they are optimistic. Even though many think today's high turnout will favor his opponent, the Frawley camp is still holding the line. We ran our campaign the whole time on Dan's record, uh, which we think is a good record. We got that message across to the voters in the last, uh, you know, three, four months, and uh, the response has been positive, so, uh, you know, we expect to win tonight. It's estimated that bad weather can cut a voter turnout as much as 50%. Whoever is the next mayor of Wilmington may have these people and the weather to thank. In Wilmington, Richmond Airy, the 10 o'clock news. The man who played Norman Bates in the legendary, legendary thriller Psycho is dead tonight. Anthony Perkins died today at his Hollywood home from complications of the AIDS virus. He died peacefully with his wife and sons at his side. Perkins broke into the movies in 1953. In 56, he went on to make friendly persuasions with Gary Cooper. Perkins earned an Oscar nomination for that role, but he was best known as the awkward, neurotic killer Norman Bates in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Anthony Perkins, dead at 60. Still ahead tonight, it's up, up and away for the shuttle Endeavor, plus a show that's really for the birds in Valley Forge. Starting this month, the presidential candidates will be showing their true colors. The Philadelphia Daily News, now in living color. Finally, there are pumps that are as fashionable as they are comfortable. They're easy spirits. Dress shoes with all the cushioning and support of athletic shoes. Now available in new styles and colors for fall. New Easy Spirit Pumps. Looks like a pump. Feels like a sneaker. The jackpot for the new Powerball game from the Delaware Lottery is estimated at $5 million. See if you're a winner tonight at 10.59 p.m. on Fox 29. <laughs> table with the best from false Graf and omega buy a 20-piece false Graf service for four and get a five-piece place setting as a bonus plus save 25 percent on our entire stock of false Graf accessories elegant flatware is timeless with oneida buy eight place settings and get four more for just one dollar at strawbridge and clothier's housewares sale and show 
1992 is Cadillac's year. STS, Seville, El Dorado. Now you can drive a brand new 92 El Dorado for under $15,000. That's right, lease an El Dorado for 30 months, and the total of your payments, including a $1,500 down payment, is under $15,000, thanks to a special factory-to-dealer incentive. See your Cadillac Super Network dealer now, because this offer will not last long. Drive a new El Dorado for under $15,000. Hurry, don't miss out. Come to Choice Seating's 13th anniversary sale for the lowest prices, newest styles, and a free anniversary gift. But hurry, five days only. This sale ends Monday. Karen, hitting is wrong. You're bigger, you're stronger, you take time out, and you don't hit. Do you understand? Take time out. Don't take it out on your child. NASA's 50th shuttle mission blasted off into the history books today. The week-long mission of the shuttle Endeavour lifted off this morning, carrying the first black woman astronaut and the first married couple in space. On board the shuttle are several dozen experiments, including one from Thomas Jefferson University. Astronauts will study the effect of microgravity on chicken eggs and embryos. Two of Philadelphia's municipal unions are suing the city over current contract negotiations. District Councils 33 and 47 filed charges yesterday with the State Labor Relations Board. The unions say the State Board, set up to oversee the city's finances, is illegally interfering with contract negotiations. City officials are calling the suit frivolous and a desperate move by the unions. Supporters of the revamped Philadelphia Housing Authority were taking their case to public housing tenants today. Congressman Lucian Blackwell helped residents of the Mill Creek Housing Development kick off the Tenant Pride Program. The campaign is an ongoing effort to beautify the city's public housing projects. The Valley Forge Convention Center literally went to the burbs today. As Farland Chang reports, hundreds of people flocked there to see Pennsylvania's first bird show of the year. I think they're, they're one of God's most perfect creatures. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. They're funny. Marsha Hammer is among the several hundred bird owners who believe their bird is the best in all the land. And they are competing to prove it at this bird show in Valley Forge. After retiring three years ago, Al Hart went from owning one bird to 100. Well, it gives me satisfaction to uh, pair up two birds and, and breed them and uh, see the young ones raised and uh, exhibiting them at shows like this. The best bird wins based on appearance, behavior, and talent. The prize for the owner is not so much the $100, but the prestige of being a top-notch bird breeder. A few, such as Jack Francis, start their own bird business. He says it's a labor of love, even though he makes little money working 80 hours a week. It's a fun business. It's a lot of work. You're talking about raising baby birds. I feed babies from day one, which uh, is around the clock. You can buy a bird here for anywhere between $10 to $10,000. These parrots from the Amazonian jungles go for about $1,000 each, while this parrot from the South Pacific goes for about $1,500. Oh, it's $2,000. This is the bird that was on um, Beretta, Crichton Cockatoo. <laughs> Joe Kalamaga has been searching all over for an African gray. He thinks this one would be worth the $800 price tag. They play a lot. Uh, they, you don't have to take them out for a walk like a dog, you know, and they don't make big messes like a cat or other animals. They're fun. Just kiss But one bird owner warns, once you own that first one, you will never be able to leave the flock. In Valley Forge, Farlin Chang, 10 o'clock news. Still to come tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Bold, and here's what's happening. Leaders of the city's largest union have said no thanks to Mayor Rendell's last best contract offer. But the second union, mired in a stalemate with the city, is calling on high-level politicians to intervene and work out an agreement. Fran Viola reports. Solidarity was the theme sounded by delegates from DC 33's 250 bargaining units today. They voted overwhelmingly to reject Mayor Rendell's last best contract offer, making a strike a definite possibility. At this point in time, our members totally understand the issues and are prepared to do whatever is necessary to make sure that they get a fair and just contract. Yesterday, the mayor offered a four-year contract with a 2% increase in the third year and a 3% increase in the fourth. Paid holidays would be reduced from 14 to 10. For health care, the mayor wants to replace the union-run plan with three other plans administered by the city. What he has on the table is not the same. It's less, and it's going to cost our members money. I personally still think 
that there is some hope. I think the door's been left open at least a little, a crack. White Collar Union President Tom Cronin is taking a more conciliatory approach, saying his negotiating team is studying the city's offer. For the first time, he called on political leaders like City Council President John Street and State Representative Dwight Evans, who was key in negotiating the teacher's contract, to get involved. SEPTA workers also got a new contract this year. I certainly don't think it would be fair uh, to have two groups settle and another group offered far, far less and be forced out on the strike. Like I said yesterday, we're always willing to listen. The mayor says whatever the unions do, they must move quickly. Blue Collar Union President Jim Sutton says he plans to bring the mayor a counter-proposal, but doubts it can be done by the Wednesday deadline. Let me make it clear, if there's not a contract, signed contract by 5 o'clock on, on Wednesday, we are going to implement our last offer. The union leadership says it could take as long as three weeks for it to come back with its counter-proposal. Mr. Sutton says if the mayor insists on implementing his own plan by the Wednesday deadline, he will take the city back to court. In West Philadelphia, Fran Viola, the 10 o'clock news. Abington School District teachers are still set to strike come Monday. Teachers met with school district officials today to no avail. That means all Abington schools, including daycare programs operating in those schools, will be closed Monday if no settlement is reached tomorrow. Salary and health benefits are main issues in the dispute. The world is facing its worst currency crisis in 20 years. And today, leaders from the seven richest nations pledge to work together to ease the crisis. The finance officials of the United States, Japan, Germany, Britain, France, Canada, and Italy met for more than seven hours today in Washington. After their meeting, they pledged to cooperate closely in world currency markets to resolve the growing crisis. In a three-page written statement released after the meeting, the G7 members gave no indication that Germany had relented on the key issue of interest rates. Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady was upbeat. The impression that I had about today's G7 meeting uh, was it was calm and quiet. Uh, there wasn't a lot of finger pointing. And uh, I think the fact that this communique is calm and quiet gives me the confidence to feel that markets, uh, they'll make adjustments. But of key interest to the worldwide currency situation is tomorrow's vote in France. At issue is the Maastricht Treaty. It would unite the 12 European nations with one currency and single policies on economics, foreign and defense. My heart says no, but my head says yes. The vote in France is said to be too close to call. All 12 EC members must ratify the Maastricht Treaty. Germans say they too want a chance to vote on it, but German politicians have rejected the call for a public vote. The German Bundestag is expected to vote on the treaty in December. The United Nations Security Council has voted to suspend Yugoslavia from the world body. The UN General Assembly is expected to approve the same resolution on Monday. The action intended to pressure Serbian leaders to stop the bloodshed in the former Yugoslav Republic of Bosnia. Fighting there shows little sign of letting up despite ongoing peace efforts. Heavy fighting today left the parliament building in Sarajevo in flames. Thousands of people have died or lost their homes in that civil war. The UN hopes to resume relief efforts in the next few days if the fighting subsides. In Somalia, the country's main warlord is calling on United States to withdraw 2,000 Marines now stationed off the Somali coast. He says the Marines will not contribute to peace. He's also ruling out deployment of an additional 3,000 UN troops in the famine-stricken country. The demand came as an armed group of rebels tried to raid an airstrip where Canadian and German planes were unloading food for thousands of starving people in Somalia. Coming up, the Clinton campaign tries to get out the vote in Philadelphia's African-American community. And in Chester City, it's a parade to help a band with no uniform. Citibank Visa wants to give you a free gift just for using your Citibank card. All you have to do is enroll in the Citibank Free Gifts Program. Then use your card the way you normally do. And soon, you'll be getting your own free gift. We know you have other choices. So this is our way of rewarding you for choosing the Citibank card. Not just Visa. Citibank Visa. To enroll now, call 1-800-CITIBANK.
Mitsubishi believes that a luxury car should offer something beyond the usual luxuries. It may be extraordinary power and control, a consummate blend of comfort and performance, or a state-of-the-art four-wheel drive system. The 3000 GT, the Diamante, the Montero. Lease the luxury car of your choice. Only $3.99 a month for 36 months. Mitsubishi, the word is getting around. The road is the ultimate test. It demands the will, the determination, the energy to go further. At Texaco, you'll find that energy in System 3 gasoline for improved performance in all octane grades. It's not just in our products. It's also in our services. Everywhere you go. At Texaco, we meet the challenge of the road and then go even further. Public notice. Three-day sale. For three days only, save on all furniture and mattresses. Hurry in now and save up to 75%. Top quality three-piece living room suits. Modern and traditional bedroom groups. Nationally advertised mattress set. Thousands of items must go and we're prepared to deal. All quantities limited. First come, first served at National Warehouse. There's one near you, Philadelphia, Yaden, Newcastle, Trenton, and Pennsauken. Phone 1-800-688-9856 now. National Warehouse, National Warehouse, National Warehouse! Wow, it's free prizes and great savings at the new Future Rest. This weekend, save as much as 50% on our most popular water beds and bedroom sets. Only at the new Future Rest. President Bush took some time off from the campaign trail today. He's spending the weekend in strategy sessions at Camp David. Meanwhile, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton picked up an endorsement from the Admiral, who led the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President Reagan and Bush. I believe that the stakes in this election are considerable, both for the national security of this nation and for the prospects of stability throughout the world. My discussions and contacts with Governor Clinton have led me to believe that he is the most qualified man to set us on a successful course for the future. While Republicans are pressing their attack on Clinton's draft record, Kraut says the issue is only a peripheral one and it shouldn't distract attention from domestic problems. Also today, retired General Norman Schwarzkopf suggested that Clinton's draft avoidance could come back to haunt him if as president he ever had to deal with a war. The African-American woman who ran for president 20 years ago was in Philadelphia this weekend to stump for the Clinton-Gore ticket. As Farland Chang reports, Shirley Chisholm tried to fire up the Democrats' most loyal constituency. Life in the Abbotsford housing development is far removed from life in the White House. Living in public housing, you're at the bottom of the totem pole. How are you doing? Yeah. But Shirley Chisholm is trying to bring the White House back in touch with the project. As the first African-American elected to Congress, she is a symbol of hope. But she says progress does not come easy. If you don't participate in these elections, you will get what you deserve and you will deserve what you get. The woman who ran for the White House 20 years ago blamed the Reagan-Bush era for putting African-Americans out of work more than any other group. As for Clinton, Chisholm admits he is not perfect. Indeed, he has been criticized for focusing on middle America and the Reagan Democrats while neglecting the plight of the poor in the inner city. But Chisholm says there is no other choice. We have to deal with the fact that the most important resources that a nation ever has, which is its people, are really, really deteriorating and things like that. She called on African Americans to register to vote because she expects a close election. Residents know that for them, the stakes are high. What's at stake is the dignity of our people, jobs, education. Uh, what's at stake is recreational and educational uh, facilities and needs. Uh, there's a lot at stake. Our very lives are at stake. Tomorrow, Shirley Chisholm will visit some of Philadelphia's African-American churches as she continues her cross-country campaign to improve life in black America by putting a Democrat back in the White House. In Germantown, Farlin Chang, 10 o'clock news. Philadelphia police and SPCA officials converged on a house in Richmond tonight. Fight over abortion, right to life versus pro-choice has turned ugly. Wait until you see what the fight over the environment has turned into. They cut me here, and they cut me down the side of the neck, and burnt me with a cigar. I had no idea that there were people out there who could do this sort of thing, who would go this far, who would try and terrorize someone. Hello, Merchant Ivory. Their New York office, the headquarters of what many in the movie industry consider the best-run film company in the world, 
is modest and distinctly un-Hollywood. The company has fewer full-time employees than you'd find in a mailroom at a major Hollywood studio. There are no business affairs people. There are no lawyers. The contracts are done very quickly, let's say in 24 hours as opposed to six months. Within that six months, we have already finished our film and it's about to be marketed. So that is that great difference, you know, what Hollywood does and what we do. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Wally Safer. I'm Ed Bradley. I'm Steve Croft. I'm Leslie Stahl. Only primetime news hour. Fox 29's The 10 O'Clock News. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy Matasek. And I'm Rich Noonan. Here's what's happening tonight. There is something weird going on in that house. That's what neighbors of one Port Richmond couple are saying tonight. The couple was arrested last night for allegedly sacrificing live animals in what some would call a bizarre religious practice. Farland Chang says the couple is hiding from angry neighbors tonight. Escorted to safety by the police, William and Clara Nenadich chose to flee their home after neighbors found out about their religion. Slaughtering the animals the way they do, and with the kids around? I don't think so. Not around here. They'll go back to where they come from and do it. The couple was arrested last night for allegedly committing cruelty to animals. Authorities acted on a tip. And instead of Mindy Fresh Scope, where's my scope? There was something from the medicine in mouthwash. It looked blue, but it still smells something like medicine. I need my scope. It's okay. Relax. Feels great. We're continuing on with our upper body workout that you can do at home with us. Now hitting those hard to work triceps. <laughs> Jennifer starting with the um, barbell lying tricep extensions. Notice her thumb is on the si same side as her fingers. This is very important. You don't want to have it on the opposite on the side. Opposite side right, right, there you go. She's okay. bringing the bar nice and slowly to her forehead and pushing up, keeping the elbows tight. Mm -hmm. This is an exercise, Kiana, that you have to do really strict, and you have to do it nice and slow. Yes. Concentrate. Good. This is one of my favorite exercises to do. Is it? Well, yeah, well, well, you I'm concerned about my underarms all the time, so I like to get them in great shape. Yeah. For women, it is a concern, having flabby underarms. This will take care of it. Okay. This actually, this movement works the entire tricep area, all the way from the elbow to your back. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Next. Barbell okay. coming through. Again, thumbs on the other side. Okay. Now, when you bring the, the bar down, push straight up with the palms towards that blue sky. You know what else I noticed? That sometimes I have a tendency to break my wrists, and that's wrong. It's taking off the It'll, area that you exactly. want to work on. Good point. So a keep those wrists. Spot, okay, right. You can even use wrist straps if you have problems with that. Come on up. Now, our goal on body shaping today is to tone up the triceps rather than building muscle mass. So we're keeping our repetitions between 12 and 15, and we're using lighter weight, but we're still getting an intense workout in. Bring it down and up. I'm going to do five more. Okay, five. Three to four sets for you at home. You can do this along with us if you have a light barbell or even two small Three. dumbbells. But this is one two. where you definitely need a spot on. And one. You want to take the bar? Okay. Okay. Would, uh, would you want me to spot Kiana, or do you want to spot her? I'll spot her. I'll okay. spot her, okay. I think I'll, I'll watch, I'll make one. sure she's doing 30. it right. <laughs> Keep an eye on me. Keep make an sure eye I do on it right. <laughs> and where should my thumbs be? On this side. There you go. That's right. Palms up. One. And you can actually see, Jennifer, where she's working the muscle. From the shoulder to the elbow. Notice I'm locking out my elbows. Lock out the arms That's and flex. Right. Also, you, you notice that Kiana's holding in her abdominal muscles and her the small of her back is pressed down onto the bench. Nice and flat. Because it supports her, otherwise she can strain her back. And she's more advanced, so that's why she has her feet up on the bench. But for beginners or people who don't have, voila. Voila. <laughs> Good balance, well, feet on the ground. More. 13. One, two. 14. Very good. That's it. You did good. We did, we did 15 yeah. reps. Yeah. It's wonderful. Okay, let's uh, go on to the next, next movement. Exercise. Is for the upper area of the tricep, the kickbacks. Oh. Who wants to start with that? I'll let Jennifer start. Okay. Go this way, it'll be easier. Okay. okay. She's supporting her weight on the bench. And you can do this at home if you have a piano bench or even a chair, or you can do it on the floor. She has her elbow right next to her waist. Notice this part of her arm is still, and she's just moving right here and flexing. Good. 
It's a very isolated movement. Don't rock your body and bounce. Make sure and just flex that tricep. Some people people go like this. Right. That, that gets the top of the, the tricep, is that correct? The top part? The upper and tricep. The upper tricep. The other one was getting the under part. The entire tricep. So, you, you know, you're working the entire arm when you do this. It's a total package. That's right, the total package. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Passing on the torch. You gotta well, do you the other arm. The side. <laughs> gotta oh, keep man. an eye on her. <laughs> yeah, I know. You don't want to have uneven muscles, do you? <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> and if we want a spot, we just help her right up here. Mm -hmm. Just like this. And up. You know, Kiana, sometimes people Good chance. do a heavy, heavy weight and they have a difficult time keeping the elbow nice and straight. So they're really defeating the purpose of the exercise. Right. Start lightly for you at home. This is new for you. Get the form down first and then increase your weight. Okay. All I'm right, now who wants it? I'll take it. What <laughs> about the other side? Oh, no. Okay. All right. Now, let's okay, say you don't up. have a bench. You can do it like this, Kiana, without a bench. Also, sure. If you just keep. Exactly. You don't need a bench. So, this is great because if you get yourself some dumbbells, a body shaping home gym, you can actually get a terrific workout right at home and don't have to go to the gym. Or if you don't have time, or if you have children and you can't leave them alone, or husband or boyfriend, you can't leave them alone. <laughs> okay, two more. Okay, let me do oh. the other side. Yeah, I was okay. 12. Okay. <laughs> Careful. Oh, stay still. <laughs> okay. Okay, keep that arm still, Mary Jean. Down a little bit more, right next to your waist. Good. Up. It also helps to have a mirror so that you could see mm -hmm. yourself doing the exercise. Right. We want the dumbbell to stay no high, come up no higher than the level of your arm. There you go. So just flex. You can see it working right in through here. How many exercises for the triceps would you do in one trip to the gym or one exercise session at That's home? a good question. Six to eight total sets. So we're showing you three exercises today. Do between two to three sets of two each exercise. One. And two. Okay. Good. Your next. My turn. Could okay, you I'll show you. Oh, sorry. Maybe show it how if you use if you don't at have the same it. time. Okay. Or? Oh, that was good, huh? Okay. All right. Both at the same time, since Jennifer asked for it. <laughs> Elbows in. Don't need the bench and flex it up. You can see her muscle working right here. Now, when you do these, Kiana, you I notice you also squeeze, squeeze right. at the top of the exercise. Make sure and don't bounce. Stay along with us. We'll be right back with the body shaping tip of the day. Keep going. Okay, flex. Introducing the Body Shaping Total Fitness System that allows you to design your own workout program with a selection of steps, home gyms, and videos that will burn up to 300 calories to lose weight in the privacy of your own home. The Body Shaping Total Fitness System offers a unique combination of steps, home gyms, and videos. This special TV offer starts with a body shaping step for only $29.95 and gets better with a new adjustable step. The body shaping step is skid resistant and the adjustable platform provides three levels for increasing intensity. Add the body shaping home gym to firm and tone your upper body. Also available are three step videos for beginner, intermediate and advanced. To order your body shaping total fitness system, call toll free now. Call 1-800-354-3800 to order the body shaping step for only $29.95. Ask the operator about body shaping's adjustable step, home gym and videos. It's back. Back where it belongs. The NHL returns to ESPN when the Stanley Cup champion Penguins face Eric Lindros and the Flyers. Tuesday, October 6th, live on ESPN. Hi, welcome back. It's time for our body shaping tip of the day. Our letter comes from Lee Fletcher. He writes, I watch your show every morning, and I just recently started bodybuilding. I wanted to know if you might be able to give me some tips on self-motivation. Okay, Lee, the way I motivate myself is I visualize how I would like to look. If I'm working my arms that day, I visualize how I'd like my arms to look, and that spurs me on. If I'm working my legs, I visualize how I'd like my legs to look, and that spurs me on. This is what you could do, Lee, to motivate yourself. That's a good point, Mary Jean. And Lee, remember, just as Mary Jean said, it's a long-term goal. You want to make sure and have that picture in your mind. You may not get it right away. You may not achieve your results today. But if you keep that picture in your mind and every day do something towards that goal, you'll be more likely to stick to it. That's right. 
to send your letter to Body Shaping and receive this beautiful 8x10 photograph of the Body Shaping cast, just send $3 to Body Shaping, P.O. Box 781, Radio City Station, New York, New York, 10101. And thank you for all your letters. Thank you for watching us today, and thank you for all your letters. We had a great workout for our upper body in 25 minutes, and we'll see you soon. Come on, let's go for a swim. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha. The cast of Body Shaping wears Gildemark's Breathables Body Wear. Accommodations provided by the Turtle Bay Hilton and Country Club, located on the north shore of Oahu. This has been a High Bar production in association with ESPN. and for thousands of dollars in special liquid food called TPN, both prescribed by her doctor. Five, Medicare said four. forms were not filled out correctly. If it comes to the point where they're not gonna pay for my TPN, I mean, that's my, that's my survival. That's my food. I mean, my digestive system cannot function properly the way a normal person can. So what am I gonna do? I'll starve to death. Camilla Bork told the committee today that Medicare denied payment to her late husband a double amputee for a special lift chair prescribed by his doctor. My husband didn't fit their definition of a patient with muscular disease of the legs. Well, how could he fit in that category? He didn't have any legs. Many seniors are being put through a bureaucratic water torture to secure their rights under Medicare, and it's time that these practices stop. The committee says that the number of claims wrongly denied by Medicare contractors has quadrupled since 1980. Some say the Bush administration tolerates these bureaucratic mistakes because they cut Medicare costs. Critics say their case is bolstered by the fact that 65% of patients who appeal Medicare denials win reversals. But the committee claims that most patients, especially the elderly, are unwilling or don't know how to appeal and end up paying out of their own pockets or cutting back on medical treatment. Mark Potter, ABC News. Our second story tonight is from the South, and it's also about money, how to pay for a college education. The governor of Georgia is proposing to let the state pay for two years of tuition costs for students who make good grades. The money would come from a state lottery if voters approve it in the fall. Here's ABC's Al Dale. Georgia is among the bottom 10 states in the nation in the percentage of high school students going on to college. The free tuition lottery plan could change that. It would motivate um, people to go to school, I mean, especially, you know, people who really don't have the funds to attend college. If I was able to get the first years of college paid for, that would do wonders for my dad. He'd love that. Here is how the Georgia plan would work. High school graduates with at least a B average and whose family income is less than $66,000 a year would get their first year of tuition free at state colleges, universities, and technical schools. They would get the second year free if they maintain a B average. They would still have to pay room and board. Governor Miller estimates it would cost $40 million a year to be financed by the $250 million a year in profits the state expects from the lottery. It's either new ideas or new taxes, and I think a new idea like the lottery is a lot better than taxes. But critics say the tuition plan is a gimmick to attract votes, and the governor cannot guarantee that the money will be available. The lottery, don't bet on it. He's promising and assuming that the $250 million will come in. It seems to me that that is a false hope. The head of the financially strapped university system welcomes the idea. It's going to be a motivating factor to perform in high school and to set higher sights than maybe otherwise the students and their parents might set. By most accounts, the lottery is such a popular issue that its approval is almost certain. The free tuition proposal does not hurt its chances at all. 
Al Dale, ABC News, Atlanta. Well, at most of California's state colleges and universities today, students were outside their classrooms to demonstrate against the governor's decision to cut $146 million from their schools. The students say their tuition is too high and their classes are being cut at the same time. In a moment, some astonishing floods that washed away parts of southern France. On the American agenda tonight, what the candidates have done and say they will do for families. And finally, did the violence of a rapper's lyrics lead to murder? This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Brought to you by Tylenol. 2 a.m., 36 Pine Street. Apartment 4C has a backache and can't sleep. 3C overdid her afternoon workout and is paying the price. 2C had an aching back, but fortunately, she also has Tylenol PM. With extra strength Tylenol pain reliever, plus a gentle ingredient to help her sleep. And a good night's sleep was all she needed to make her day a whole lot brighter. Tylenol PM, so you can rest easy. Get this hot, you'd better get to Sears. I hear my battery gets faked. Only Sears has the Die Hard. In demanding tests for starting power, Die Hard performed three times better than industry standard. This time, I'm getting a Die Hard. You can count on me. Die Hard. More power when you need it most. There has been a devastating storm in southern France. At least 27 people have been killed. Another 50 are missing. Most of the victims were in the small town of vaison la romaine in the region of Provence. One girl who was trapped in her home there said, We heard people screaming for help in the streets, but we couldn't do anything about it. Here's ABC's Jim Bitterman. In a matter of minutes, the river that runs through vaison la romaine rose 50 feet. And as an amateur cameraman captured the dramatic scene, Cars, recreational vehicles, and houses were washed away, sometimes with people still trapped inside. The flood was the result of torrential rains, which in some places dumped 21 inches of water, two-thirds the average annual rainfall, in just a few hours' time. 24 hours later, survivors are still searching lists for word of loved ones. A local gymnasium is now a temporary shelter and more. Many of the missing are believed buried beneath tons of mud, Riverside campsites and housing subdivisions simply disappeared. Many parts of the country reported freakish weather. The French Weather Office counted a record 58,000 lightning bolts in a 24-hour period, more strikes than are normally registered in an entire year. Officials said that across the flooded areas in southeast France, a total of 30,000 homes have been damaged or destroyed. And in Vezona Romain, which never suffered anything like this in its 2,000-year history, the fire department commander said it looked worse even than if a dam had burst. Jim Bitterman, ABC News, Paris. From Moscow today, information about two American civilians who were imprisoned by the Soviets back in the 1930s. A Soviet-American commission looking into the fate of Americans who disappeared there many years ago heard today that the two civilians in question were finally executed because they knew too much. Here's ABC's David Ensor. The Americans on the POW MIA Commission welcomed the new information from Russian President Boris Yeltsin, but they are frustrated that the facts about hundreds of Americans who may have disappeared in the Soviet Union are trickling out only slowly. I don't think we've made as much progress, Mr. President, as I had hoped. Malcolm Toon says the problem is the KGB archives are still controlled by people with the old communist passion for secrecy. Still, he now has files on two American civilians who died on Stalin's orders. Isaiah Ogden and Charles Clifford Brown, or Brown Clifford, both arrested in Moscow in the late 30s on what the Russians said today were trumped-up charges of spying. Both were killed. After Ogden was executed, the Russians told U.S. authorities he died of natural causes. President Yeltsin uh, uh, described this case uh, in some detail, and he said that this was a terrible thing to do, absolutely unconscionable. And he agreed with me that uh, those were terrible days under the old Soviet regime. Stalin ordered both men killed because they had seen the horrors of his vast prison camp system 
They knew too much. General Dmitry Volkogonov, Russian co-chairman of the commission, believes the communists may have killed many foreigners to keep the world from learning about the camps. Among them, the famous Swede, Raoul Wallenberg, who saved hundreds of Jews from the Nazis. U.S. officials are visiting five places in Russia this week, following up leads on other American prisoners. While they do not expect to find any American still alive and held against his will, President Yeltsin said today that he is not ready yet to give up the search. David Ensor, ABC News, Moscow. At the United Nations today, the empty seat tells the story. Last night, the United Nations expelled Yugoslavia's Serbian-dominated government from the General Assembly, punishment for the military support Serbia has given to those Serbian militias fighting in neighboring Bosnia-Herzegovina. In Bosnia itself today, Serbian forces shelled a hospital in the Muslim town of Dihac. Nine people inside were killed. And in Sarajevo, three people died when a tank shell hit a Red Cross soup kitchen. The other night we had a report from Southeast Asia about the brutal military occupation of a place called East Timor by one of America's closest allies in the region, Indonesia. Today, members of the Senate Appropriations Committee have voted to punish Indonesia by suspending some American military aid. The matter now goes to the full Senate. On Wall Street today, the Dow Jones Industrials lost two points to close at 3278, and the trading was heavy. When we come back, today's political campaign, this year the message is increasingly becoming negative. Do you get diarrhea too? Yes, I get diarrhea. My immediate reaction is, oh my gosh, oh, I'm in trouble. I use kale. Good evening, I'm Jill Chernikoff. And I'm Lee McCarthy. Here's what's happening. The deadline has passed. There is no agreement, but the city's last best contract offer is in effect. The unions don't like it, but as of this hour, there has been no strike. Mayor Ed Rendell went on television tonight to tell both taxpayers and union members that he had delivered on a promise. Barbara Grant has the story. The Rendell administration is on the fast track to making their last contract offer a reality for city workers. And the mayor says they have nothing to fear. Remember, the great thing about this contract is unlike New York, and unlike Pennsylvania, and unlike the state of New Jersey, we avoid massive across-the-board layoffs. Rendell, in a televised speech tonight, said he wasn't looking for a political victory over the unions, but had to reject their last counteroffer, submitted at 9 this morning. For the wage part of it, you consider the benefit part of it, that uh, uh, we would have been $300 million in the hole. There will be no contract signed that will produce this type of cumulative deficit at the end of uh, uh, the four-year period, ever. At about 5 o'clock this afternoon, the Rendell administration handed reporters a stack of documents indicating their readiness to impose the new contract. It includes everything from a new ordinance for city council ready tomorrow to a hospital and physician directory for employees who enroll in the new health care program. And several pieces of the new contract timetable will fall into place tomorrow. City council meets in the morning. They'll introduce new pension legislation that will eliminate double dipping. That means no more disability pension and workman's compensation at the same time. It will also end partial pensions for city employees who start second careers. In the afternoon, the Civil Service Commission and the Administrative Board will meet to approve new holiday, sick leave, and overtime policies. This system is, is for all kinds of emergencies. The city is now on the alert under the control of the Emergency Command Center at the Fire Administration Building. They say essential services will continue in the event of a strike and they pulled city cars off the street today as part of an elaborate plan to protect property and employees who must come to work. But if there is no strike, life will go on as usual for a while. For the average municipal worker, um, you, that, that he or she is not going to see a very significant impact from implementation. The biggest change will come with the deadline for enrolling in the new health care plan around mid-October. I have struggled personally, intervened with our negotiators, to make sure that we've constructed a contract and a benefit package that will not put you or your family at risk. Meantime, the administration says it will continue talking to unions, hoping they can come to some kind of official agreement. At City Hall, Barbara Grant, the 10 o'clock news. City union leaders were quick to respond to Mayor Rendell's offer. A spokesman for Blue Collar District Council 33 says that the union is, quote, absolutely opposed to the last best offer. Union leaders say that they will fight for a better deal, but are not saying how or when. Farland Chang joins us from our newsroom with more on the union reaction. Farland? Lee and Jill, there will be no strike tonight, and workers will be back on the job tomorrow.
but the unions say they will fight. It's just a question of when and what weapons they will use. Is that you want me to tell you exactly what day we're going to strike and what day we're going to do this and that? And I'm not going to do that. Okay? And I'm not going to do that because I think that this mayor has certainly postured himself and is an enemy. And I don't think that you give the enemy, in this case, the time of day. It means that when the mayor makes his next step, we will make our next step. At this point in time now, we are communicating to our members and to the citizens of Philadelphia. We intend to show up to work tomorrow under the existing terms and conditions of our contract. We will not, I reiterate, we will not be humiliated and broken. But we're here today, and everybody else should be down here, because this is critical, this is scary. This is, this is it. This is it. This is everybody's job. Late this afternoon, blue-collar workers from the city's water department showed their irritation after learning that the mayor is implementing his last best offer. A small but vocal group gathered outside District Council 33, home to 12,000 blue-collar union workers. Two hours later, some watched Mayor Rendell on TV explain that the city will go down the drain unless wages and benefits are brought under control. The mayor told them that no one would be laid off and the city would gain in the long run, but workers were not persuaded. He is asking for us to ratify a contract that would give managers the right to hire, fire, and transfer any person they want. That's favoritism. That's not fairness. He feels that we're ready for war. Like our business agent said, we'll go along with whatever has to be done. The bottom line is don't give nothing back or let's go to war. What if they say no strike? Well, if we say no strike, we have to go along with our union, what our union leaders say. But as far as the membership goes, I think it's time to go. Now, that worker may be ready to go, but his union leaders have not yet given the green light. The union still has several weeks before the full terms of the mayor's contract kick in. So, for now, the union is playing a game of wait and see. But, sooner or later, there may be a breaking point, unless the two sides can settle. Tonight, that prospect looks bleak. The union says there are no negotiations going on right now. I'm Farlan Chang, reporting live back to you. Okay, Farlan. Thank you, Farlan. The city's police department has been working on strike preparations for weeks, and today... It's ...failed to follow up on other offenses like indecent exposure or to examine the conduct of senior officers who tolerated what was going on. Coming in for the harshest criticism is Rear Admiral Duval Williams, head of the Naval Investigative Service. The report describes Williams as a man who does not want women in the service and who called women pilots, go-go dancers, and hookers. He will be forced to retire. So will the Navy's top lawyer, Rear Admiral John Gordon. Admiral George Davis, the Navy's Inspector General, will be reassigned. Navy Undersecretary Dan Howard, criticized for failing to lead a thorough investigation, will keep his job. He was relegated to the task of being a referee because he relied on those with professional expertise in investigative matters. Those professionals fail him. For the Naval Investigative Service, Tailhook is the latest in a long line of botched investigations, including the so-called Sex for Secret scandal involving Marine Embassy guards in Moscow and the explosion aboard the battleship Iowa. The NIS will now be headed by a civilian, and the Navy Secretary says he is determined to end all forms of sexual harassment. We get it. We know that the larger issue is a cultural problem which is allowed demeaning behavior and attitudes toward women to exist within the Navy Department. A leading critic of the Navy was encouraged. They did get it. They came up with an excellent report. They are removing people who were in uh, critical roles. Late today, the two admirals forced out called the report unfair and a disservice to the United States Navy. They promised to set the record straight in the days ahead. Bob Zelnick, ABC News at the Pentagon. Officials of the Tailhook Association say they do hear Navy Secretary O'Keefe's message that sexual harassment won't be tolerated, but it may be too late to ensure the Tailhook survival. Here's ABC's Gary Shepard. The 15,000-member Tailhook Association has taken some heavy hits during the year since the now notorious convention. These are tough times. Got to be right up front. It's, uh, it's been a diff very difficult year for Tailhook. Promotions for hundreds of those who attended last year's convention have been put on hold. This year's convention was canceled, and the Navy has withdrawn all support 
of the Tailhook Association. I can foresee no conceivable circumstance under which the Department of the Navy will ever renew its links with the Tailhook organization. The Hilton Hotel chain says the association is no longer welcome in Las Vegas or at any other Hilton. Lawsuits have been filed against the association by four women charging sexual harassment. And more than 600 Tailhook members have resigned. At the headquarters in San Diego, officials are attempting some kind of damage control. They have written a letter of apology to the Navy, hired a public relations firm, and changed the rules for any future conventions. We're certainly not going to have the hospitality suites. Uh, there's, we want to convey the, the, the word that there is no party. Uh, there's, there's nothing to come for if that's what you want to come for is to party. Tailhook officials make the point that much good resulted from the discussions between naval officers, their commanders, and defense contractors who attended their conventions. But that has been overwhelmed by what happened at last year's gathering. The damage is so bad, Navy insiders say privately, Tailhook is history. Gary Shepard, ABC News, San Diego. The rest of the news in a moment on the American agenda tonight. Issues that matter to working women and where the candidates stand on them. A barrier to women falls in professional sports. She plays pro hockey. And a 12-year-old boy who wants to divorce his natural parents. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Brought to you by Cotton Incorporated. With trusting eyes, the children show Minds open, hearts true, our spirits grow Italian food at its freshest are coming home to Contadina, pasta and sauce. Contadina, the freshest ideas in Italian cooking. Congress has begun the process of trying to override President Bush's veto of the family leave bill, the one that would require companies with 50 or more employees to give them time off without pay for family emergencies. The Senate overrode the President's veto today there do not appear to be enough votes in the House at this point to do the same. In Orlando, Florida today, a 12-year-old boy has gone to court seeking a divorce from his natural parents. It's a case that's generated a great deal of national attention. Barbara Walters, who was the first reporter to talk to the young man last week, reports for us tonight on today's developments. Gregory Kingsley sat quietly as lawyers argued over his future. He claims he was neglected by his natural parents and abandoned to the foster care system. When his foster parents tried to adopt him, his natural mother objected, so he is asking the court to terminate her parental rights. Gregory's lawyers accused his mother, Rachel Kingsley, of being an unfit mother. By the, the close of this trial, it will be conclusive that this child, Gregory Kingsley, has been severely and repeatedly neglected. Rachel Kingsley denied she's unfit and said she put her children in foster care so she could get her life together. What was your understanding of, of the placement of your children? That if I worked hard, that I could have, that I, my children would be returned to me if I completed the agreement and worked hard. But witness after witness painted her as an abusive, self-centered woman who took drugs, drank, had sex for money, stayed out all night, and attempted suicide after being left by a female lover. That I was sitting at the table with Rachel, and she got up, and she smacked him across the head, and he fell on the floor screaming. Gregory finally has a chance to have a decent life with people that love him and care about him. What is unusual about this case is not the fight over custody, but that a judge has allowed the child involved to initiate the case. Gregory talked to us last week on 2020. Your attorney said that you might have a better chance if your case was filed by an adult. You said no, you wanted it to be in your name. Why? Because I knew if I put it in my name, it would make it different. It wouldn't be 
become an adult doing be a child doing it and it would make it different it might be able to help other children it's like if we win this case then they won't be able to put uh, children in foster care so long like they do no matter what happens in this case the very fact that a judge is hearing it sets a precedent in the continuing controversy over the legal rights of children. Barbara Walters, ABC News. Here's a story that deserves the headline, Will It Never End? The Senate Committee on Aging heard testimony today about confidence tricksters who were cheating older Americans out of their life savings again. Here's ABC's Dennis Trout. This commercial has helped to sell thousands of emergency alert systems to the elderly. I've fallen and I can't get up. One company in Arkansas is charging $6,000 for the device. The state government says that amounts to fraud, since the same system can be rented from a local hospital for $10 a month. Witnesses told senators such schemes to get money from the elderly are becoming more aggressive. 77-year-old Archie Wilcox got a letter saying he would win a million dollars, but first he had to send in $5,000 of his own money. Wilcox admits he fell for it. You have saved up a certain amount over the years you worked. You want to protect it, but here's a chance to multiply it. One woman in Minnesota got three bags of mail soliciting money that way. She was cheated out of $65,000. Her savings are gone. She is down to her Social Security, and at times uh, she's even gone without food in order to keep sending the money. This radio tape player was described as a home entertainment center by salesmen offering it as a gift with the purchase of $800 worth of vitamins. You're looking lovely today. Minnesota is fighting back with commercials warning the elderly. I never buy anything without discussing it with Harold. Ah, oh, come on. Can't you make decisions without your husband? But Harold is not my husband. Dennis Trout, ABC News, Washington. On Wall Street today, the Dow Jones Industrials gained nine points to close at 3287, and the trading was heavy. And we'll be back in just a moment. There's a certain itch that's so private, most people will only discuss it with their doctor. Fortunately, now you can get new Anusol HC1 ointment. Over the counter, with the same prescription strength doctors have prescribed most. Day after day, you make those glasses of thick Metamucil disappear. Why not make them all disappear with FiberCon? Doctor recommended FiberCon gives you the same fiber regularity in tablets. Easy to swallow tablets. Get doctor recommended FiberCon. Why do you get Fox News? Good evening. I'm Lee McCarthy. And I'm Jill Chernikoff. Here's what's happening. Philadelphia's non-uniformed workers were in court today trying to stop Mayor Ed Rendell from implementing what Rendell calls his last best contract offer. Union leaders say there will be no strike before the court rules. Barbara Grant reports. Gather. Labor leaders were on talk radio today explaining their response to the sweeping changes in benefits and work rules Mayor Rendell put into motion last night. They say it's all illegal and would kill the union's ability to protect its members. These are uh, the guts of the union, the things that make a union work. Unions went to court for an injunction to stop the mayor's actions. Their petitions argue the changes would cause irreparable harm. Among other things, the new contract will halt payments to the health, welfare, and legal funds and cut insurance benefits for pensioners. Sutton said there would be no strike before the courts rule on the petition next Wednesday and spent much of today trying to jumpstart negotiations. I mean, if the courts will make it happen, fine. If, if John, if, uh, President Street will make it happen, fine. If I can make it happen, fine. If the mayor can make it happen, fine. I just want to get us back on track. Council President John Street has been acting as chief diplomat, shuttling between sides to bring them back to the table. There are signs of progress. He says the sides are closer together today than they were this time yesterday. There won't be any peace unless we get some contracts that the unions can live with, that the mayor can live with, that the citizens of Philadelphia can live with, so that we can move on to the next chapter in our recovery. Street presided over a council meeting that would help advance the mayor's implementation timetable. Bills hit the floor, paving the way for layoffs if the mayor has to do that to save money. They would repeal early retirement provisions. An item in the newspaper, and I believe he said it last night, was that he was going to take away early retirement. Well, Mr. Mayor, 
Try it. The administration says it has the votes it needs to pass any new contract measures. It certainly had the votes necessary to pass dozens of work rule changes at a Civil Service Commission meeting this afternoon. But an angry dissenter, Commissioner Ona Weldon, said the proposals were being pushed through too fast. But I'd be darned if I'm going to play into some politics and I don't even want to say this on television, but you think I'm going to sit up here and let a bunch of two white men and everything just tell me what to do, play puppet? This labor controversy may be generating some anger and causing a lot of confusion around City Hall, but there is a parallel process operating. The two sides are talking, at least through third parties, and as long as there's talk, there's still hope for a negotiated settlement. At City Hall, Barbara Grant, the 10 o'clock news. While the unions were criticizing Mayor Rendell and taking him to court, he was being praised in other circles. Rich Noonan has that story. Mayor Rendell is using some tried and tested political rules in his battle with the city unions. Rule number one, don't surprise the constituents. The mayor warned city residents he would take on the unions long before he won the election. To achieve that cost-cutting, I would be happy to take that strike, and I think I can win it. Now that he is mayor, Ed Rendell is keeping his support base happy. The business community has been standing with the mayor. Position. Today, it stood for him. To rise and give Mayor Rendell our unanimous vote of confidence and support by acclamation. The mayor went quickly to the political rule book, turning a negative into a positive for chamber members. There's a feeling that this possibly could be the city of the East Coast, the leading city of the East Coast for the next decade. His supporters would say Ed Rendell has done a masterful job in winning support against the union leadership. He has taken his case to the people in terms easy to understand. Textbook good politics. Listen to this made-for-TV comment. And there is no money to do the things that they want to do. And I can't print money any more than I can grow hair. Like any good politician, the mayor is reaching out to his enemies, trying to divide and conquer. His message to union members. That's eminently fair. It makes sense. They ought to take it. And I know that hundreds of workers have been contacting their union membership leadership and saying, take this contract, take this contract. And I think the leadership should listen to them. The mayor's political savvy has not gone unnoticed outside of the city limits. This morning's Wall Street Journal hailed the mayor as a courageous hero. But taking a page from the political handbook, the mayor is not gloating. He's still sounding like a battling underdog. I want you to know... Wherever this goes, we'll hang in there because we simply have no alternative. Thank you. Mayor Rendell's defining hours may very well come when trash piles on the streets of this city and furious municipal workers pick at his every move. At that point, he may have to cash in some of the political capital he's been banking for months. But if the unions blink, this mayor will have more political clout within the financial community than any mayor before him, clout that will carry him for years to come. Rich Newman, the 10 o'clock news. A Canadian man awaits extradition to Bucks County after a kidnapping attempt was foiled when the victim jumped out of a moving car on I-95. It started just after 4 yesterday at the Langhorne Shopping Center. Police say a man kidnapped an 18-year-old woman at knife point, forcing her back into the car. In North Jersey, the woman jumped out of the car as it moved at 55 miles an hour. She was cut and bruised and suffered a broken wrist. The suspect, 25-year-old Jean E. Bouchard of Quebec, was arrested a short time later after smashing the car into a motel. Philadelphia's bomb squad has been called in on an investigation at a suspected drug lab tonight. Police were searching two rental garages at the public storage on State Road when they discovered that one of the garages is booby-trapped. The bomb squad is still working to defuse the device. Police say at least one of the garages contains chemicals used to process methamphetamine. A deadly new designer drug is being sold on the streets of Philadelphia. It is the synthetic depressant fentanyl. Barlin Chang reports that the drug has killed several people in the past month. Not far from the cemetery in southwest Philadelphia, a killer drug is being sold, sending its users to an early grave. It looks like heroin. It is a depressant like heroin. But fentanyl can be 2,000 times stronger. Just a pinch, injected or smoked, can kill. Now we've picked up uh, these 12 deaths in the course of the last three or four weeks. That's a dramatic increase for us. There have been four times as many victims in the past month as there were in all of last year. Victims who overdose come from the streets of Southwest and West Philadelphia, where drug traffic is high. The drug is being sold on the street as heroin, under the name China White. The Drug Enforcement Administration suspects the drug comes from a homemade lab and then to the user. If they should happen to get this fentanyl rather than heroin, if it's mismade, they absolutely are going to die. 
Last year, in economically depressed Coatesville, at least two victims died after an overdose caused breathing problems. In this summer alone, the designer drug has spread throughout the region. We had uh, four deaths reported in Pittsburgh. Uh, we had several deaths in North Carolina, and uh, there are some deaths in New York. To prevent any more deaths here, the city has issued a public health advisory. It hopes drug abusers will get the warning before it is too late. Investigators say it is still too early to know just who is supplying the drug and how it is being distributed. While the search for the source continues, the drug is expected to keep killing. In southwest Philadelphia, Farlin Chang, the 10 o'clock news. The New Jersey shore at this hour is feeling the effect. Captain Barnowski about it. He says, hey, no big deal. He's seen a lot worse than this, but he was tripling up the lines on his boat just in case. Oh, it's a lot of fun, ain't it? It's really great down here when it's like this. There's nobody around. But we're watching it. We're taking care of all of this here stuff. It won't get no worse than it's getting now. That's hoping for the best, but no one can predict what Tropical Storm Danielle can do as she moves closer. This morning, Ocean Drive took on a little too much ocean in some spots in Sea Isle City. Some drivers hit the brakes and backed off, but the roads remained passable. tide in Ocean City brought water up onto the boardwalk. It was a lot to see, but no damage reported. So far, it's charm. Where else can you see something like this? As long as your uh, home uh, stays intact, why, you're very fortunate. So again, Renee and Tim, at this point, the face of the ocean, the Atlantic, looks menacing, but it has not caused any damage yet. The tide at this point is still substantially out to sea, but everyone around here knows that the next high tide is headed in between 7 and 8 o'clock tonight, and it's anyone's guess what Tropical Storm Danielle can do if it lands here. Reporting live in Ocean City, I'm Andrew Glassman, Channel 10 News. Okay, Andrew, stay high and dry. That uh, sure. will be the magical time tonight, then. Stay with Channel 10 as we continue to cover the storm. We'll have the updates as they warrant and, of course, on the Channel 10 News at 5.30 and 6 o'clock and 11 tonight. Well, also in the news this noon, there is only the sound of silence in Philadelphia's showdown with its municipal unions. Informal talks were held in Center City last night. No word, though, of any progress. It's been two days now since Mayor Ed Rendell imposed a contract on 15,000 city employees. The two unions representing those workers have gone to court to block implementation of the contract. The unions say they won't stage a job action until a judge rules on their request. A hearing is scheduled on that for Wednesday. And, of course, stay with Channel 10 News for the latest developments between the city and the labor unions. We'll have updates at 5.30, 6, and 11 o'clock tonight. Well, it's been a full week of no classes for students in Abington. This marks day five of a teacher's strike. Well, I think we're going to do two sets of the extensions. I think I'll go up and wait, and I'll try 35, so you might have to spot me a little bit. Remember to exhale on the way up. One. Good. Two. Two. Three. Four. Five. Come on. Notice I'm flexing my foot. You can also vary the exercise and point your toes. I'll do two more. And good. Let's move on. Okay. Leg what should we do? Okay. Leg okay. extensions. All right. Okay. I'll start, start off okay, since you good. just finished there. Okay. Now the leg extension, also called the knee extension. Okay. What we're gonna do here? Press the weight up. Bring it down nice and easy under control. And I'm gonna try and get 12 to 15 reps. Notice Sherry's form here. Squeezing at the top and releasing it slowly. You don't. You want to prevent yourself from bouncing and hurting your knees. Is that correct? That's correct. Good. And you can flex your foot. You can point your toes. Turn your toes outward. And all of this works your muscle development in a different angle. And 12. Look at those legs. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. I want legs like yours. <laughs> yeah. Ah. That's it. 
and I'm pressing the small of my back into the back of the seat here. Keeping your head back. Chest out, control your, control your breathing. Ooh, I can feel it burning already. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There what is that, about 15? No, I'm going <laughs> eight. Nine. Two more. And 10. Okay. Ooh, turn. One more set. Okay. Now I'm going to increase the weight, okay, because I'm really concentrating on trying to build muscle instead of toning and just shaping. For those of you with weak knees, you want to make sure and not go too heavy. Maybe you want to increase the amount of reps you do as opposed to lifting real heavy weights on the leg extension machine. Perfect and form. All right, Kiana, your turn. Okay, one more set. A set. Okay. I'm going to try this one with my toes Point it out. Point it out. And that'll work more of the inside of my quadricep. Alrighty. And remember, you want to keep a 90 degree angle at the end point. So in other words, for the beginners out there, you don't want to rest you and don't drop the weight. Right. Keep the resistance right. constant. Okay. okay, now next and we're gonna one move. more. Oh, yeah, next we're gonna move over. Leg press. The leg press is an excellent machine for supporting your lower back and working your legs as opposed to using, let's say, doing squats. That's right. So you press up, release the levers, and then you bring down, all the way down. Stretch, Good. lock it out. Now notice Sherry's form. She keeps it slow, a nice slow movement with perfect form. She doesn't bounce her knees. Good. This is my second favorite exercise. What's your favorite? Squats. That's my favorite, too. Yeah, and you know, when most people can't do the squat, they'll convert to this machine here. This machine's also excellent for doing calf presses. That's right. Different variation. Okay. Kiana, your turn. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to take a little bit wider stance here. Remember to keep your lower back pressed firmly into the back of the seat. And two. And exhale as you push the weight up. Three and four. Come on. Five. Five. Six. Six. Nice you know, slow this, movement. Yeah, down this exercise also, you know, works the glutes, the quads. Very important, the ladies, to work the glutes. <laughs> Nine. One more. And ten. ten okay. No, I'm going to add weight. I'm going to put 45 down since oh my God. I'm trying to concentrate okay. on building, and Tiana is trying to concentrate on toning and shaping. I'm getting a little shoulder workout here <laughs> for you. Okay. Feet approximately shoulder width apart. Release. Bring down all the way down to the shoulders. Press up. Good. Nice and easy. Two. Three. That feel great. Yes. Four. Five. How many are you gonna get? Twenty? Twenty-five? No, only ten. <laughs> and Seven. one more. Don't miss. Eight, two more. Come on, no, Sherry. Just add to me. All right. Okay. One more. You want to try this? I'll continue the set. And we'll be right back. Ready? Okay. Forty-five. Here I go. That's ah! Okay. okay, and one. There you go. This is heavier, Control Sherry. Your breathing. Two. And three. Oh, four. Like you said, if you're trying to tone or shape, you don't need to use this much weight. Five. But if you want to build, you need to use Six. heavier weights. Seven. Yo ushered Perot into a conference room in the Hart Senate office building for a secret meeting held at Perot's request with members of the POW MIA committee, among them Chairman John Kerry of Massachusetts and Vice Chairman Smith. According to sources, Pro said he could obtain the release of as many as 30 American prisoners of war and sought the committee's encouragement. He did not say how he would free the men or where they are being held or how he found out about them. 
Perot asked the senators if he should obtain a videotape of the prisoners or bring one of them out. He was encouraged to concentrate on freeing the Americans. Perot left saying he would get back to the committee. James Walker, ABC News, Washington. Another source this evening tells us that Ross Perot was not promising he could do this. He was asking the committee, what if he could? We have tried unsuccessfully to get in touch with Mr. Perot. Ross Perot's also caused this to be quite a stunning day in presidential politics. He denied a published report that he plans to announce his candidacy on a television talk show on Monday night, but he has summoned representatives from both the president and Governor Clinton's campaigns to meet with him in Dallas on Monday. Evidence of Mr. Perot's political power? Both sides are sending high-level delegations. ABC's Morton Dean on the Perot waiting game. We do not have any official word as of yet. It's like planning a well-publicized wedding and wondering whether the groom will at long last show up and say, I do. Perot seems to be on the verge of announcing his intentions. Workers in his 50 state organizations have been told about what steps he should take. The results were predictable, Illinois an example. By an overwhelming margin in the high 90 percent, uh, our volunteers are asking loudly and clearly for Ross Perot to come back as an active candidate and run for the presidency. There's no official word yet when Perot will go public with his final decision. But if Perot runs, it would be without help from many of his former high-profile supporters, including Calvin Waller, the retired general who was second in command of Desert Storm. He's troubled by Perot's unpredictability. I just find, find it rather fascinating that uh, we would go through the step that we have gone through and now to see that uh, Mr. Perot has decided that maybe he wants to re-enter. I find that it, it, it is a little eccentric. Eccentric or not, having Bush and Clinton representatives show up to help Perot make up his mind adds a strange new element to an already unusual political odyssey. Morton Dean, ABC News, New York. Now, we said these were high-level delegations going to see Mr. Perot. Let's tell you briefly who at least some of them are. On Governor Clinton's side, Mickey Cantor, the campaign chairman, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral William Crow, and Senator Boren of Oklahoma. That's to represent Governor Clinton. Very high delegation. From the president's side, Bob Teeter, the campaign chairman, General Scowcroft, the chairman's national security advisor, and one other senator whose name I promise I had, Phil Graham of Texas. Uh, Britt Hume is with the Bush campaign, which is out in Chicago today. Britt, why is the president sending such a high-level delegation to see a man who has yet to declare his candidacy? The feeling, Peter, is that this campaign, which would like to be able to tell uh, Ross Perot to fly a kite, can't afford to do that, that this might be an opportunity to woo some Perot supporters by persuading them that the president has a credible deficit reduction plan, that being an issue of great concern to them, and the feeling is they can't afford not to compete given the dynamics of the race. Thinks Perot can hurt the president seriously in this campaign? The, the feeling, Peter, is that Perot could hurt uh, the president very seriously in some states, possibly by re-entering the race, help him in others. But what this, what this campaign is looking at now is a race that that the high command realizes that if it keeps going the way it's going, it's going to lose. And so any opportunity to, to change the dynamic, perhaps by winning over uh, key Perot supporters, perhaps by winning over Perot himself, is something they must try for. Okay, Britt, thanks very much. And with the Clinton campaign here in the East today is uh, our correspondent with the Clinton campaign, Chris Bury. Chris, the Clinton campaign, frightened of Ross Perot? Why this high-level delegation? Well, for many of the same reasons, Peter. They claim that they just want to listen to what Perot has to say, and give Perot a chance to hear Clinton's plans about reducing the deficit. It is worth noting that twice in the last week, including today, Clinton has criticized Perot's plan to cut the deficit, saying it would involve too much short-term pain, including probably a tax hike on middle-class Americans. Okay, thanks, Chris. Chris Drury with the Clinton campaign, Britt Hume with the president's campaign. In a moment, the other news. Magic Johnson resigns from the president's AIDS commission because he says the president is utterly ignoring its work. The boy who wants a divorce from his parents takes the witness stand in Florida. And on this Friday, our Persons of the Week trying to make a decision. Now at Red Lobster. Well, we've got a new special tonight. It's got everything. Petite lobster and two kinds of shrimp for just $10.99. Start with petite lobster tails, sweet and delicious. Add our savory scampi. Then our famous grilled shrimp to top off a terrific dinner. 
It's new. It's petite lobster and shrimp two different ways. For a limited time, just $10.99. It's delicious. And it's only at Red Lobster. Every day should start with Quaker Oats. I feel real good because I eat real good. Hot Quaker Oats. Nourishing, pure, and powerful. to know more people have taken Somonix over the past 30 years than any other sleep aid. Safe, simple Somonix. As if this wasn't a difficult enough day for the presidential campaigns, given the demands of Ross Perot, there is very public pressure on President Bush tonight from America's most famous person with the HIV virus. The basketball star Magic Johnson said today he is quitting the Presidential Commission on AIDS and he accuses the Bush administration of utterly ignoring its work. Here's ABC's John McKenzie. From the time Magic Johnson joined the commission last year, his frustration with the Bush administration was clear. At this meeting in January, he urged the president to get more involved in the fight against AIDS. I want to emphasize that uh, the people want uh, to hear from him, too, that he's uh, behind this. They want to hear his voice as well. Today, in his letter of resignation faxed to the president, Johnson said the White House has routinely ignored or opposed the commission's recommendations. I cannot in good conscience, he wrote, continue to serve on a commission whose important work is so utterly ignored by your administration. AIDS is a crisis of monumental proportions, and it cannot be fought with lip service and photo opportunities. Johnson did not discuss the resignation today, but some of his fellow commissioners did. Well, my personal reaction is disappointment. He's been a wonderful commissioner and a very fine person to work with. His frustration is uh, really not an isolated element. I would say it's shared by a lot of us. Magic, as he is known to millions of fans, will soon announce whether he will return to professional basketball. He quit the L.A. Lakers last year when he discovered he had the AIDS virus. He immediately began a widespread campaign to warn young people of the threat of AIDS and the importance of safe sex. I mean, anybody can get it, because I thought, uh, not me. The White House responded to the Johnson letter today, saying it spent nearly $5 billion on AIDS research. A spokeswoman added, It is unfortunate that Magic Johnson failed to recognize the tremendous commitment and compassion and resources that this administration has committed to this problem. Those who served with Johnson on the commission said he had been an important and involved member of the group, but that as a celebrity, he can have just as much impact outside the commission informing the public and fighting the administration. John McKenzie, ABC News, New York. Today's other news in Orlando, Florida today, the 12-year-old boy who is suing his mother took the witness stand to explain why he wants a legal separation from her. ABC's Mark Potter reports on what Gregory Kingsley had to say. Raise your right hand to be sworn. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And have a seat up there, Gregory, and sit up real close to the microphone. Gregory Kingsley answered questions for more than an hour. His mother, Rachel, cried through most of his testimony. He said she made him live for years with relatives or in foster care, and then seemed to abandon him. Did she send you presents? No. At Christmas time, did she send you presents? No. How about on her birthday? No. He rarely looked at his mother. During the last eight years, he lived with her for only seven months. At that time, did you feel like your mother was taking good care of you? Not all the time, no. Okay. When, did, when didn't you feel like she was taking good care of you? When she would stay out real late at night and drink all the time and bring friends to him and wake us up all the time. Gregory has hired his own attorney and is asking the court to terminate his mother's parental rights so he can be adopted by his foster parents, George and Elizabeth Russ. Are you doing this because you want to hurt your mother? No. Are you doing it? Why are you doing it? I'm doing it for me so I can be happy. Are you doing it because you love the Russes too? Yes. Judge Thomas Kirk seemed sympathetic when he noted that Gregory also wants to change his name to Sean, the name of his best friend. That it's like he's trying to start a new life. Is that what you're trying to do, Greg? Sean? Yes. Okay. Sean, you have a seat over there. Rachel Kingsley's attorneys claim that she is now a fit mother and wants her child back. They also argue that the court should do all... Everyone, Lee McCarthy has the night off. I'm Jacqueline Bolden. And I'm Jill Chernikoff. Here's what's happening. 
Tropical storm Danielle is continuing to wind its way up the east coast at this hour, packing winds at about 60 miles per hour. The storm is weakening as it moves at about 10 miles an hour toward the Delmarva Peninsula. There is still potential for heavy rain, beach erosion, and coastal flooding. Farlan Chang looks at Danielle's impact on the Jersey Shore. Hours before high tide, the surf from Tropical Storm Danielle started crashing into Ocean City's boardwalk. It was rebuilt after last winter's two destructive storms. While children played on it, others praised it. The boardwalk so far is holding up. They have new brackets tied down to all the joists, and uh, it looks good so far. A few blocks away, the boardwalk was protected by newly added sand. It is part of this summer's soil replenishment project, but the beach was starting to erode already. I feel that, hey, once the ocean keeps coming in, rising in, like there won't be no leaves. It's coming out much more than it was this morning. I don't think it's, it's even not even high, high tide yet. yet, so I expect it'll get a little worse. And things did get worse with high tide, just after 7 p.m. The tropical storm surf is pounding against the bulkhead, and the boardwalk is slightly vibrating. And officials say this is just the first of four more hours of such conditions. That's because Danielle's winds unexpectedly change direction. They are blowing directly toward the shore thus prolonging the high tide. So authorities ordered spectators off the boardwalk. Ocean City Police say the boardwalk is okay, but not the sand dunes from 17th Street and above. We're suffering erosion. We're suffering severe erosion. The section we're in now for the next 35 blocks has not been pumped with new sand. There's nothing between us and the ocean except bulkhead. The storm flooded some of the streets several blocks away from the boardwalk. Officials urged drivers to park on higher ground. But the police say this is not a life-threatening crisis. No one is required to evacuate. After tonight's high tide, though, another rough one is expected tomorrow morning. In Ocean City, Farlin Chang, 10 o'clock news. The state of Delaware is experiencing flooding and coastal erosion in Kent and Sussex counties. Governor Mike Castle has called for a limited state of emergency. That measure... Good evening, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Bold, and here's what's happening. Tropical Storm Danielle gave the East Coast a good soaking before dying out earlier today. Beaches were pounded and miles of shoreline eroded as the storm came ashore last night. Roads were flooded. Many became impassable. And off of Island Beach State Park in Ocean County early this morning, a 35-foot sailboat was swamped. Two passengers were able to swim to shore. A third man drowned, and a fourth person is still missing. But overall, the storm's impact was much less than feared. Rich Maneri reports from Ocean City, New Jersey. Tropical Storm Danielle took it easy on the New Jersey coast. In Ocean City, there were only a few reminders that a storm had been here. Bud Callahan works at an oceanfront condominium. Around here is just a lot of sweeping up and uh, high water, you know, up on the decks and all the water and all. And they're emptying out the pool. So that won't be any factor. Most of the damage from this storm was done here, where the wind, rain, and pounding surf eroded beaches. In Ocean City, part of a multi-million dollar beach replenishment project was swept away. A few blocks south, there was hardly any beach left, and nothing to stop high tide from reaching the steps of the boardwalk. A storm last Halloween wiped out about five blocks of Ocean City boardwalk. That storm was still fresh in everyone's mind as Danielle passed by. There was a great deal of concern on the island that we'd get the same kind of beach erosion, and we really didn't. Not much damage. With the exception of beach erosion, nearby towns like Sea Isle City were also spared, but Rose Dotty well, was prepared you know, for the uh, worst. Uh, the natives here really feel that the uh, news media always makes it worse than what it is, but... Uh, Hey, you got to you gotta, uh, uh, respect Mother Nature. <laughs> Forecasters say the storm could have been much worse. By early afternoon, it was moving north and losing steam. And for most, Danielle became a memory. In Ocean City, Richmond Airy, the 10 o'clock news. A $34 billion package of tax cuts and spending programs has been worked out by the Senate. But don't expect to see it become law anytime soon. President Bush has indicated that he will veto it. The bill contains extensions of two tax increases on high-income earners. They are the largest tax revenue generators in the bill and the main reason that Mr. Bush doesn't like it. The measure came on the heels of the Los Angeles riots and was meant to fund social programs for blighted rural areas and inner cities. But critics say it has become more of an election year Christmas tree 
with lots of benefits for lots of special interest groups. Mr. Bush went looking for a little bit of Harry Truman's old campaign magic today. The president began a two-day whistle-stop trip through Ohio and Michigan on board a special 21-car train. In Ohio, the White House announced that it was sending an unspecified number of Apache and Black Hawk helicopters to Israel. The shipment, part of an agreement between Mr. Bush and Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. And on politics, the president charged that Bill Clinton would raise taxes on middle-class Americans to pay for his proposed policies. Well, Bill Clinton told supporters in New Hampshire that the only thing wrong with America is the president's economic policy. The Arkansas governor pitched his own economic plan, but also faced new questions about the draft. The L.A. Times quoted two Republicans who said they arranged a meeting between Clinton and the head of the Arkansas Draft Agency in 1969 to get Clinton's induction notice canceled. What they did was totally routine. I did what my local draft board told me what the procedures were, and I followed them. I don't recall whether I did it in a meeting or a letter. I just don't remember. Clinton wrapped up his New England campaign tour this evening after stops in the traditionally Republican states of Vermont and Maine. One time, presidential hopeful Ross Perot may officially announce his candidacy next week, but the latest round of polls show that the novelty of a three-man race has apparently worn off. Newsweek reports that Perot would only get about 9% of the vote, well behind President Bush and frontrunner Bill Clinton. The Texas billionaire fared a little better in the time CNN poll, 17% said they would vote for Perot, but the Perot factor is really no factor in Clinton's nine-point lead over the president. In South Africa, talks between the white-controlled government and the African National Congress are said to be making progress. President F.W. de Klerk and ANC leader Nelson Mandela met for the first time in three months to discuss peace and the future of South Africa. Even the archenemy of the ANC, the Zulu Nation, voiced its support for the talks, which are focusing on ending political violence. Although the Zulu tribe is not directly involved with today's meeting, de Klerk called on all South Africans to help bring peace to the troubled country. We cannot, in an atmosphere of violence, while supporters of parties are fighting and killing each other, peacefully and successfully negotiate. But his request seemed to do little good as both sides met. Ten people were killed when unidentified attackers stormed the black township of Gengashi. Coming up, some athletes try to score with hope in Camden. Later, German-Americans celebrate their heritage with the annual Stubende Parade. Mm -hmm.